You know the people who knew exactly what they wanted to be when they grew up? The doctors, the lawyers, the marine biologists, anybody out there? Well, that was me. I wanted to be a marine biologist when I grew up. I studied it in school. I worked at one of the top research institutions in the world. Even got a tattoo. <laughs> but I found that I was going down a path that was getting narrower and narrower. And I was missing that big picture. I wasn't really sure if marine biology was what the career was for me. And so I wanted to explore something else. I took a leap. I landed in a large city. No job, no car, just these. My legs and my feet were how I got to know San Francisco. I walked everywhere. People came to visit. I didn't take them on the cable car. I walked them everywhere. These tours got dubbed Molly's Fat Camp Tour of San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Up and down the hills we went. But walking was how I got to learn and experience the city. I found things inaccessible by car, small shops whose signs I would have missed, seals surfacing on the bay, which of course was very appealing to an unemployed biologist. But then I really started to see the city. This represented a shift in how I viewed the world. I noticed the conditions of buildings by how they were painted and what hung in the window. I noticed which streets had healthy street trees and good lighting. I didn't go down the streets that didn't. I started avoiding the touristy places and started seeking out the authentic places. Valencia Street on Friday night, the Castro at Halloween and all its drama. Chrissy Field in the fog. What started as urban exploration became inspiration and eventually consortship. And this was how I found planning and urban design and how I found my passion. As an urban designer, my job is to create comfortable, interesting places that are designed for people first. But I've made three observations that I want to share with you today. Our time is valuable. We desire personal connections and we are human. As cities have evolved, we have prioritized speedy, efficient movement of vehicles and goods, but we've forgotten to keep things convenient for pedestrians. For example, we insist on assuming that pedestrians will obviously want to walk out of their way to move around from place to place. Here's an example. Imagine you are here. You just got off the bus. You're carrying a couple bags of groceries, it's the end of a long day, and you're attempting to carry a tired and squirmy toddler. My husband calls this act wrestling an angry badger. <laughs> I hear that some of you are familiar with that. <laughs> you have a choice. You can A, walk more than a quarter of a mile down to the nearest crossing. Cross at the signalized intersection across five lanes of traffic and walk more than a quarter of a mile back up to your apartment complex, which is directly across the street from where you are currently standing. Or B, you can take your chances along with a few other bus riders and dash across the street where there is no crosswalk. So what would you do? Don't forget it's the end of a long day. You've got your groceries and that angry badger. <clears throat> You may not admit it to the person that you're sitting next to, but I bet that you would take the shortest distance between two points because your time is valuable and it doesn't make sense to walk all that way out of the way. We desire personal connections. You may be looking for the solitude sometime, but once in a while, and maybe more often than you're looking for a little bit of action. Here's an example. A crowd has gathered. This naturally piques your curiosity. Do I talk about curiosity? So you go to check it out. And in so doing, you found a bluegrass band playing it in the street, or a chalk artist, or some weirdo with puppets. But it's interesting, it's different. <laughs> And it's probably memorable. Here's another example. Maybe you need a cup of coffee or you're hungry. Do you A, 
go to the cafe with empty tables and chairs out front. Or B, do you, do you go to the cafe with tables full of people, lively conversation, and a little bit of dapper shade? Well, unless you're really hungry, you're going to go to that busy place because that's where the people are. That's what's interesting. You choose the busy place not because you know how good the food is there, but be, you go because of the people. And maybe they know something you don't know. And maybe you don't talk to anyone except your server, but sitting there at that busy cafe, you are connecting with the city. You are watching what Jane Jacobs called the street ballet. The business types, the students, the hipsters, the convention goers, you watch them all move from this seat at the city theater in a type of urban dance. And maybe you do strike up a conversation with the people at the next table. My dad is notorious for leaning over and interrupting a table full of beautiful women, much to this day, with my mother. <laughs> but we desire personal connections. Robert Putnam tells us that Americans are losing community. Our circles are smaller. Public spaces, that is parks, streets, plazas, these are the physical spaces where we can still make those connections. And we desire those connections. That's why people attract more people. We are human. We have legs and feet. We have a body, and we use it to move around. When you think about it, your commute may start here and end here. But you are a pedestrian before you get in your car and before you get to your destination. At the, when, at the essence of it, every trip starts and ends with being a pedestrian. We need our legs and feet to get from place to place, from our car to our office, from our office to our bike, or to the train. Every trip starts and ends with being a pedestrian. We are human, on average five feet six inches tall. But we've been so focused on getting places quickly and efficiently that we've traded that for engineering standards, not human standards. Let me give you some examples from here in Salt Lake. In downtown Salt Lake, 20% of all trips to and within the downtown are made on foot. And this doesn't count those little trips between your car and your destination. However, 14% of all the land in the downtown is dedicated to pedestrians. It's the parks, it's the sidewalks, the landscape medians, the plazas, 14% of all the land. By contrast, 39% of all the land in the downtown is dedicated to, to cars and automobiles. This accounts for all the parts of the streets designed for cars and all the surface parking. The rest is dedicated to development. What this says to me is that we disproportionately distribute the public realm towards the private automobile rather than to people. Let's look at some other examples. This is the intersection at State Street and 4th South in downtown. How we shape our behavior actually favors vehicles over people. We have bollards behind which the pedestrian must stand, buttons the pedestrian has to push, lettering on the ground that tells the pedestrian to beware of the cars. But we have wide turning radii that allow the cars to take the corners at higher speeds. The pedestrian light changes at the same time as the traffic light. And then the countdown begins five seconds after it says walk. None of these things say people first. These are engineering standards, not human standards. And then we have the orange cross, my favorite orange cross device. <laughs> this is something fairly unique to Salt Lake. In 2000, Salt Lake began installing small buckets with these orange crossing flags at various intersections throughout the city. They were intended to improve pedestrian safety. And they worked. And that's great. But wouldn't it be better if we designed our streets to allow a pedestrian to cross the street without having to carry some silly orange flag with them? People first streets shorten those crossing distances 
put the person within view of the car before they have to cross the street, allow the pedestrian to get into the crosswalk before the car has a green light, use lighting to alert people, alert drivers to the presence of pedestrians, and they're very well marked with other signs and such. Many cities have made the decision to invest in their public spaces, to invest in people first places. New York did this with Columbus Circle a number of years ago. Uh, with, they took a major traffic island with thousands of speeding cars and taxis zipping around it every day. And they made it a place for people. They installed wide benches that um, for, for people to sit. They have uh, fountains that dull the noise from the traffic and a slope burn to enclose the space. Melbourne, Australia made this decision a few decades ago as well. Their downtown at the time was compared to the center of a donut. What happens in the center of a donut? Nothing. But they made the decision to invest in their public spaces. They began with a program to activate their alleys. They called them laneways. They began with a simple grant program for signage and lighting. For example, for any business that wanted to open their business onto a laneway, the city paid for the frame for a sign, just the frame for a sign for that business. And in so doing, they promoted visual interest along the laneway. If you don't see a sign, maybe there's not anything interesting to go find. They also began to incrementally upgrade their sidewalks, widening them one at a time, using high quality materials, and reducing vehicular movement, speed, and dedicated space. Reducing, but not eliminating cars. They also developed a really fantastic program for public art. They enabled uh, cafes and businesses to spill out onto the laneways. Tables and chairs and retail spill out. And in so doing, they developed a cafe culture where none existed before. Melbourne's actually a great example for Salt Lake because we actually have quite a few similarities in our urban form. Both cities have downtown block sizes, standard block sizes, of 660 feet by 660 feet square. This is actually considered quite large by urban design standards. Both cities also have fairly wide streets, Salt Lake 132 feet, Melbourne 99 feet, also considered quite large. One of the major differences between the two is that Melbourne has these 30-foot laneways that bisect most of their downtown blocks, whereas Salt Lake's blocks, which were originally intended for agricultural use, do not. However, Salt Lake has the same opportunities that Melbourne does to invest in their public spaces and design for people first. One of the things that Melbourne does really well, and I should back up and tell you that in 25 years, Melbourne is now known as one of the most walkable cities in the world. 25 years, they went from empty donut to walkable in small incremental steps. They did it by improving the choices for pedestrians, by creating places to discover. And, you know, downtown Melbourne, if you uh, go to Streets Blog and listen to, um, there's a great little video all about downtown Melbourne. People, many people that they interview describe Melbourne as a place for, of discovery. You go downtown and you get lost on purpose, and it's fun. Choice and discovery are really important when creating a walkable city. How we discover is completely influenced by our senses. Sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste. People first places activate the senses. That's that's what makes us want to go and discover. So smell. How does your neighborhood smell? Maybe this morning you walked out and you smelled fresh cut grass, or crisp autumn leaves, or trash day. All right, so maybe it's not all pleasant, but outside is gross. In Philadelphia's Italian market, the smell on the sidewalk 
is intoxicating. Isgros is a small family bakery located in the typical row house in South Philly. The kitchen is in the basement, which is accessed via a bulkhead in the sidewalk. Those are those black doors you see behind the man with the stroller. And on typical days, a fan pumps the hot, sweet air from the ovens up on the sidewalk. And you cannot walk by without stopping in and waiting at least 30 minutes for some of the greatest cookies. Smell is an integral part of the pedestrian experience in the autonomy market. Sight. How a person experiences the city from view to view is shaped by urban design. Jan Gale, one of my urban planning heroes, uh, describes the concept of the social field of vision. At 325 feet, we can recognize a shape to be a person. This is about half a block distance in Salt Lake. At 100 feet, we can recognize facial expressions. For example, this is the distance to which theaters are typically designed because audiences can recognize an actor's facial expressions, especially those assisted with stage makeup and lighting. At 10 feet, we can, rec we can begin to initiate a conversation. This is the distance which Gail recommends to be conducive to a front yard conversation, or from front porch to sidewalk. But, uh, and then, um, Another of my urban planning heroes is Alan Jacobs. He describes the concepts of the characteristics of great streets as comfortable, memorable places that facilitate participation in, the, in community life. But perhaps Dr. Seuss said it best. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good street. You may not find any you want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. My hope is that after today, you start looking up and down streets with care. That you start seeking out the active pedestrian places with public art, beautiful street trees, cafe tables, good lighting, where the boom bands are playing. And that you start demanding these places from your cities and towns. Cities can't afford for you to head out of town because you can't find interesting things to see and do. And now, you're too smart to sell for anything less than people first, places, and streets. By focusing on the human experience, any city can develop its own version of the walk of the city. And we can do this step by step by putting people first. Thank you.